Welcome and good morning. My name is Theron Protzi. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. The story of space is a story of humans calling to explore. On behalf of all associates at Delaware North, it is our honor to share this story with the people from all over the world. Today is about honoring the three brave men of Apollo 1 who were pioneers of space exploration. This tribute to Virgil, Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee focuses on the heroes who gave their, gave their lives to further space exploration and paved the way for future space exploration. This tribute will teach many generations of the people who these heroes were as astronauts and as fathers and to know that their legacy will forever live on. We often say we stand on the shoulders of giants. This tribute serves as a reminder of these courageous heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice. They are part of an ongoing story of making the impossible possible and making dreams a reality. Today, we are honored as well to have two men from the Apollo program, General Charlie Duke, General Tom Stafford here with us today, as well as many other shuttle astronauts and future astronauts for further space exploration. I'd like to thank you for being here today as we honor these three brave men. We honor each of you, the family members, the friends, and the Kennedy Space Center workforce. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. Robert Cabana, our Kennedy Space Center director, and also a four-time shuttle astronaut. Thanks, Darren. <clears throat> so, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 1 fire, I think it's about time that we paid tribute to the crew with a memorial here at the Kennedy Space Center. And I couldn't be more proud of what we've accomplished. Uh, we did this in partnership with the families, and I want to thank the family members who are here for your time and effort in helping us make our vision a reality. I think you're going to be extremely pleased when you have a chance to get inside and uh, see what we have accomplished here. I want to thank Kelvin Manning, my associate director. Kelvin uh, led the effort to get this done on time in six months, and uh, it's he did an absolutely outstanding job. I want to thank Delaware North and BRPH for the design and building of this uh, tribute. It's absolutely outstanding. Today's tribute is about admiration and respect. Admiration and respect of the Apollo 1 crew. You know, yesterday we had our day of remembrance at KSC, and uh, Mike Collins uh, commented on each crew member. And one of the things that he mentioned was, we didn't go to the moon in spite of the Apollo 1 fire. We made it to the moon because of the Apollo 1 fire. It was because of this crew and what happened that many more crews were kept safe, that we were able to actually get to the moon. And we do stand on their shoulders. Admiration and respect. This astronaut pin that you notice over here looks a little different than the one I'm wearing. When astronauts get uh, selected, they complete their astronaut candidate training, and they're given a silver astronaut pin. And when they fly in space, they get a gold one that flew in space with them. And uh, I remember Wally Sherrod designed this pin, one of the original seven Mercury astronauts, and he corrected me one day. I was wearing it straight up and down. He walked up and he twisted it, and he said, it's supposed to point at your throat at an angle. And I said, yes, sir. And uh, Deke Slayton, the original Apollo 7 astronauts. Deke was chief of the astronaut office. Uh, Deke was medically grounded and didn't get to fly, and he wasn't going to get his gold pin. And uh, Gus Grissom and the crew of Apollo 1, they had such admiration and respect for Deke that they designed a, a gold pin uniquely for him. They knew he wouldn't wear the same one that the astronauts wore, and it, it had the diamond in the top of it. And it was their plan to fly it on Apollo 1 and give it to Deke. Well, that wasn't possible, and uh, it came upon the wives of the Apollo 1 crew to take that pin and present it to Deke. And it was uh, Neil Armstrong that took that pin aboard Apollo 11 and took it to the moon, so it finally did fly in space and was presented back to him. Deke eventually flew, flew with Tom Stafford on the Apollo Soyuz test project and, uh, and earned his gold astronaut pin, but it was always this pin that 
he wore. So just as the crew had admiration and respect for Deke, we have admiration and respect for them. So, special day. And I want to introduce somebody very special to the space program, Lieutenant General Tom Stafford, to share his remembrances on the crew in the Apollo program. General Stafford is a, a 1952 graduate of my alma mater, the United States Naval Academy, which is the undergraduate institution with more astronauts than any other. <coughs> I, I, I would like to point that out. Uh, General Tom went into the Air Force. He was also the first one in his class to make one, two, and three star rank. A four-time space flyer. He flew on uh, a Gemini 6, first rendezvous in space. He commanded Gemini 9 with the second EVA in space. He commanded Apollo 10. Didn't actually get to land on the moon, but did the first lunar rendezvous and got very close to the surface, paving the way for the Apollo 11 crew to make it there safely. And then the Apollo-Soyuz test project, uh, which set the stage for our cooperation with the Russians on the shuttle Mir program in the International Space Station. Please welcome Lieutenant General Tom Stafford. Thank you, Bob. It was really great to see this total facility, Delaware North, all the people that has contributed so much to it. It is really fitting for those three wonderful individuals, Roger, Ed, and Gus. I knew them well. They were great individuals. And it's so fitting that you have this memorial to them. Thank you, Bob, it's your idea. You know, when I think of uh, the Apollo 1 crew, and really, if you think of the total environment that we were in at the time, and everybody involved in that, from the president on down, and the 400,000 people that worked on it, I'm trying to think of something that would describe it. And to me, the one word that's probably the best suited is courage. It was courage. Courage of the people, courage of the wives, and stayed home, managed the family, courage of the technicians, the workers that did that. And just to uh, understand history, the courage that faced, that President Kennedy had to stand up to. He was faced with the fact that Yuri Gagarin had made the one orbit flight there on April the 12th, 61. And then on May the 5th, Alan Shepard did 15 minutes out of the Cape Mercury Redstone, 200 miles downstream. But he wanted something that would keep America ahead. And he had the courage to say, we will do that. But to just give you a little bit of history, he went to Vice President Johnson, who headed the Space Council, said, Mr. Vice President, I want to know, what can we do to reap ahead of the Soviets? And I need the answer in two weeks. So. LBJ was not a shrinking valley. He said, I'll have the answer for you, Mr. President. And he gathered Dr. Von Braun, Dr. Gilruth, Abe Silverstein, Max Vijay around. And in two weeks, he came back. He said, Mr. President, here's what we have. We have three situations. Number one is we do not think there's any way the United States can beat the Soviet Union on a free return around the moon. And they can say the Soviets have been to the moon. That would show the rest of the world. There's about a 50% chance that we can equal them in orbiting the moon. But we feel confident, Mr. President, there is no way that they can beat us in landing on the moon and safely returning. And that will tax the best of America. It'll put us ahead technically, economically. And Kennedy had the courage to say, that's what we'll do. And then three weeks after Al Shepard's flight, he went in front of the Congress and put forth Project Apollo. He didn't use Apollo then. He used the word, we'll land a man on the moon and safely return. Turns out we had two men on the moon and safely return, as you know, Charlie. And uh, 
from that. <clears throat> I want to talk about the three people, Roger, Ed, and Gus, and work them in with what we had. The um, first uh, became obvious, you know, to go to the moon is going to take a, a really a bridge step, something for long duration flight. Finally, around the balloon again, there were three. There were th three options that came up. The first, Dr. Gilruth at Houston, he wanted to go directly to the moon. He would have a giant booster that weigh around 14 million pounds. It would be two and a half times bigger than this one. It would be awesome. And it would drop off stages and return. Dr. Von Braun wanted one weigh about 10 million pounds, say, around one and a half times as big as a Saturn V. It rendezvous in Earth's orbit, drop off stages direct. And finally, from Langley, Dr. John Hubolt came back and said, no, the answer is a lunar orbit rendezvous. Drastically reduce the weight, the cost, the time. And he was right. So it was really one year and two months after President Kennedy made the commitment, it was finally decided how we will go to the moon. And we'll use a lunar orbit rendezvous. So we started off, but fortunately, we were very fortunate that Deke Slayton assigned Gus Grissom the task of going to McDonald, who had won the contract for Germany. And Gus lived there for nearly two years, designing the cockpit, worked on the systems, the subsystems. And in fact, everything about it was Gus. And we kind of laughingly call it the Gus Mobile. And to, to a lot of us, what made Gemini so successful was all that dedication and effort that Gus put into that. Unfortunately, we did not have the same type on Apollo. And once we started out, we, uh, uh, we started down the road. And then in Gemini, we. Uh, flew 10 missions in Germany in 20 months, which is unbelievable what we did. Was that my fault? I left off. <laughs> and uh, I was very fortunate. I was uh, the uh, assigned to the backup crew of the first flight. First crew would be Gus Grissom, John Young, Wallace Shirai, and I were the backup. But we went to St. Louis, and we lived there for nearly eight months. And we worked nearly full time with that spacecraft as it was being assembled and put together. And unfortunately, we did not have that same time frame or ability. And we didn't have a Gus Grissom to go out to Apollo as it was being formulated, put together. Rockwell had, or North America at the time, had pi a few pilots. I think they had one test pilot. And they did the best of their ability, but there was a lot lacking. But in Germany, we did. We carried out the first rendezvous, which I had the privilege of doing with Wally Germany 6. We had the 14-day duration mission. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell. We had uh, the first spacewalk. Ed White did the first spacewalk. And it was only, it was 22 minutes, if I'm correct. And he had a great time out there. But on coming back in, ingressing to the spacecraft, Ed ran into a big problem. And that was getting back in to suit balloon on him. And the Gemini was big enough, the, the shoulders balloon, that was all right. It was a height. We had a maneuver called the alley oop maneuver, where you had to reach under the panel, grab a hold of the bars, pull yourself double, and get in. And Ed came down to about that far. And I'm sure he, his adrenaline was going big. I, we know on the ground we're watching his heart rate was over 220 beats a minute. But Ed made it in and he locked the, the hatch. And from that, what happened to Ed probably saved Gene Cernan's life and possibly mine. Because Gene Cernan on Gemini 9 did the first EVA around the Earth, and he was to fly a rocket back. But what we knew, what we didn't know, so much we thought we knew, but we didn't know, 
we didn't even think about putting defog on the visor. And as soon as the sun went down, Gene completely fogged over. He was completely blind, could not see. And I was trying to, he was out trying to work on the rocket back in the back, <clears throat> blindfolded. And I could see this is going nowhere. So I called the spacewalk off. And then um, I had to get, he had fortunately put up a rear view mirror on the docking bar. And I could look through the docking bar and see his hand come up over the top of the Jiminy. And I talked him back into the cockpit. Meanwhile, I was ro rolling in pressurized this 25 foot tether. It was like a big snake in the Jiminy cockpit. You've seen Jiminy here. And in fact, well, you've seen over the Vista Center. That was a spacecraft, Jiminy 9. And uh, from there, I finally got back in, but he was about this far up. He, Gene Cerning could not get back in the spacecraft. And he did the alley oop maneuver. So I hooked up this bar and cable that they designed after Ed's experience. I said, OK, Gino, here we go. So I took it and I, with both hands and did all the leverage I had, pulled the hatch down flat, then held it with one arm, then with the other hand, guided his hand up on the lever. And with that, we got the hatch locked turn up the pressure, he opened his visor, his face was completely red. And I grabbed the water gun and just hosed him down. You're not supposed to have water in a spacecraft, but I had to get him cooled off. In that two hours and five minutes, Cerner lost 13 pounds. That is not a good way to lose weight. So we said, hey, time out on walking and working in space till we really understand it. So we, Made the next two rather conservative, and from that, the idea came up of training underwater. And you see now today on the space station, Bob, I think we have, what, 138 spacewalks about that. All very successful. And they train in that giant pool we have at Houston, five to seven hours at a time. So it's, it was, that was the learning curve. Germany was the key. Also, we know from history and seeing the Soviet archives, Germany was the program that pushed us ahead of the Soviets. And then on to, to Apollo. Well, first let's talk about Ed. I first met Ed uh, at the Cespal School. I was an instructor. Ed was one of my students. He did very well. He was assigned as a test pilot, Wright-Patterson. And I'd see him occasionally. He'd come through, and, or I'd be at Wright-Patterson. And then we were together for the, in the final selection down in Houston for the second group of astronauts that would do most of the Germany and the Apollo missions. And uh, but we did, as NASA says, it's going to be delayed. And meanwhile, I'd been assigned to Harvard Business School. So we stopped by Wright-Patterson, saw Ed and Pat, had a party with all, had a lot of students at Wright-Patterson. I went on to Harvard. I was there for three days. I got a call from Deke. Are you still interested? I said, yes, sir. He says, get on down here in three days. I said, OK. So I was a dropout. I was the first dropout of the class of 64 of Harvard Business. <laughs> I learned a little bit. And uh, so I would see Ed quite a bit. And uh, Ed was a wonderful person, always had a very positive, outgoing attitude, good pilot. Roger Chaffee. I got to know Roger for some. He was in the third group. Our assignments were not ever near the same area. But he, I, I, he had a good reputation as a good pilot. I know that Roger had great judgment because he married a lady from Oklahoma City, <laughs> Martha Horn whose parents had a large feed store. It wasn't any small feed store, it's still there. It is huge. So Roger had good judgment. Very positive person. And uh, so we finally got going on Apollo after those 10 Gemini flights. And uh, they were assigned to the spacecraft that's depicted here, I think it's serial number 012. And, uh, I was assigned as a backup commander to the second Apollo flight. Jim McDivitt 
Dave Scott, Rusty Schweiker. I had John Young and Gene Cern. And we were in Los Angeles at the same time, at the same hour, that this tragic accident occurred. And uh, anyway, the things were going so bad in the test that I was in charge of running in that spacecraft. The water, what I call, was leaking. It was electrical short. The communications was cutting out. I remember John Young said, go to Earth orbit, go to the moon. He said, hell, this thing will never make it to Earth orbit. And it was so bad, I called the tests off. said, we'll come back when you get this spacecraft fixed. And uh, so was, uh, they started to get out of the hatch, as I mentioned to Bob earlier. Uh, they had, and there was supposed to be so many seconds to open the hatch. No way, believe me. And then if you have any pressure against it, it makes it even more difficult. But uh, I got out and had an emergency call from Al Warden. We're up on a test stand. He said, have you heard about the accident at the Cape? I said, no. I said, why? I said, fire on the pad. I was fire. I was thinking booster. I said, well, what about the crew? He said, unfortunately, all three are dead. I said, it, it, I just didn't understand it. I said, Al, he was in the support room. Say that again. Are you sure? He said, yes, I'm sure. A fire in the spacecraft. So John and Gene were still down in the spacecraft working, cleaning up. So I leaned down through the hatch and said, come on, get out of here quick. I led them down to the floor, got them out there, so I don't know any details. We've just got the word we've lost. The first Apollo crew at the Cape on pad 34. I don't know any details. So that night we got in our 338s. We flew back. I remember the next morning I went to Ed White's house, saw Pat, and the little children, Bonnie, Eddie. But we were a, a group, a family. And as a way of that the whole astronaut group was, sure there was competition, but there was no Gus Grissom to be out in North America there for that two years to get that spacecraft squared away. And uh, fortunately, when it came to the shuttle, Bob, as you know, there was a lot of time spent working on that. And uh, continue on, so I think it's wonderful what you've done here, as one fighter pilot for another, it's a great exhibit in Sierra Hotel, Bob. So I'm just saying it's an honor to be here, to talk to all of you. And this was a step. And one time we're at the factory, well, factory. And a lot of us, we really just lived out in Downey, that's California. And we're sitting around the table. Wally Shira, myself, John Young, Gene Cernan, a couple others. And there was a lot of other things besides the uh, hatch that had to be opened from the outside, a uh, series of inflammable materials taken out. There was a series of other things that needed to be changed. And we were just reasoning, calculating that these three great heroes dying help save at least one other flight probably in space, or maybe two. Because had that accident occurred in space, we would have never known exactly what would have happened and all the other things. But we did find out what happened. And we made so many changes as we went to block two. It was so successful. Once we started flying there in October of 68, June 7, it was Wally Shira, John Isley, Walt Cunningham. I was a backup commander. And it was John Young, Gene Cern. But in nine months, we flew five missions. Four of them on the giant Saturn V. Three of those had lunar modules, and three of those to the moon. The most successful flight test program ever. But it started right back here with Apollo 1. And it's so fitting that it's here it's on display so the public can see how we really did it and carried it out. So to all the families, God bless you. Great to see you again. It's an honor to be here. Thank you.
Thank you so much, General Tom. At this time, this concludes the uh, formal ceremonies. Uh, we'd like to open up the event and uh, the exhibit. I'd like to offer the families uh, one more opportunity, if you'd like to be first, to uh, go through. And as, uh, as the folks up here get through, please, everybody, enjoy this uh, wonderful, wonderful tribute to Gus, Ed, and Roger. Thank you. <laughs>